Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at Telerik.com slash platform. That's Telerik.com slash platform. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 487. In this episode, Scott talks with Dominic Beyer about Identity Server and ASP.NET. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Dominic Beyer, uh, and you've worked on identity services and identity things for, for many years now, haven't you? Yeah, it feels like forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why was that an area that you uh, jumped into? Um, I think I was always like a, like a, like a believer in, uh, in the authentication as a service idea. You know, like way, way back when I installed Windows for workgroups, yeah, like the, the first mainstream way to, to connect machines in, in a home network kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you had this, um, this idea of Windows that you basically could seamlessly, uh, access resource on the network, like file, file shares and printers and so on. But to make that work, you had to go to every single machine and set up the same account with the same password everywhere. And, um, if you wanted to change your password, you had to go to all of the machines and change your password and so on and so forth. And Microsoft fixed that by, you know, introducing the, the idea of, of a domain, mm-hmm. like the, you know, the, the, the Windows domain. And that's where I got interested into in, in, in authentication protocols like, uh, you know, NTLM first and then Kerberos. And, you know, uh, the domain, the idea of a domain and the domain controller as a technical means to it solve this problem. Yeah, like single sign on across your machines and the, the, the account only lives in a single place and there's a, a service in your network that provides the authentication for all of the things that are interested in it. And, you know, that, 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 that kind of got me interested. And you know, that's um, funny. I, I remember that. Like you're, you're bringing back a point of pain from the past where we had to run around to every machine and make sure that the same users and passwords existed on the same machines. Looking back, what a stupid idea that was. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, (laughs) and I, I, by the time I, um, that was roughly the time when I, you know, finished university and the, that, that was, uh, like, like, you know, the late nineties kind of, uh, the NT4 days and then, and then Windows 2000 with this, really exciting thing called Active Directory and the protocols. And, you know, it, it was really interesting and, and, and technically amazing how this stuff worked. And um, so, you know, Windows provided and, and I was a, was a developer at the time and I wrote mostly software for intranets. Uh, well, like everybody did, I guess, <laughs> at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Windows just provided this this magic, you know, this, this checkbox, uh, enable Windows integrated authentication and, you know, that's all you needed. <laughs> uh, things started working. And, um, and, um, then uh, later on, you know, moving forward, uh, I built more and more internet uh, enabled applications. And suddenly we, we didn't have the luxury anymore of, of an active directory that, that just took care of everything, right? Um, suddenly, you know, because Windows authentication only works if all of the parties are in the same domain, like the client and the servers and, the users and all that. So, you know, built for many, many years, like everyone did, I guess, many applications with, you know, forms authentication, for example. And you wrote that login page over and over again. And, you know, writing a good login page is actually hard work. I mean, all of the the things you need to know about how to store your passwords and how to validate your passwords and, you know, brute force attacks and, you know, this and that. So, um, um, and... I thought like, why, why doesn't it, you know, like the same idea, authentication as a service, 
why doesn't this exist for, you know, non Windows environments, you know, just a- as an application service, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that got, and, and the, the whole idea of single sign on that comes with that, like, well, you know, like, 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 um, like with the active directory, you wouldn't install an AD just for a single computer, but once you have a number of computers, it gave you many benefits. And the same idea was with applications. Once you have like two or three applications, you might want to give the users a single sign on experience across the applications. So, um, and then back in 2008, I think, Microsoft released this thing called the Windows Identity Foundation, and that was the first time they they um, made single sign-on protocols that are, that were independent of Windows authentication part of .NET. Or but by the time it, it it was a separate download, but then it became later part of .NET in .NET 4.5, mm-hmm. and that's where I wrote my first what is called a security token service. So that's basically the the Active Directory domain controller for applications, so to speak. We see that that STS a lot in in URLs now, especially if you've done any kind of logging into corporations. Uh, you know, you'll you'll log into a site, you'll bounce over to a secure token service, and then you'll bounce you'll bounce back. And that seems like that marks a fundamental shift in how we pass uh, security information around. I mean, there's a lot of websites using basic auth over SSL. And then maybe using, you know, some hashed techniques over SSL. But for the most part, they're throwing their name and password around. How does this STS concept differ? So the idea is, uh, is authentication as a service. Yeah. So you're writing an application. Um, you don't have to be a security expert for that. You're, you're concentrating on your business domain you want to implement. And you have this thing called the security token service, which implements the authentication process for you. And then you use a protocol basically to hand over control to this STS thing. The STS does all of the, you know, the, the hard, complicated security stuff, validating the user's identity and so on. And the STS basically throws you back a so-called security token over the fence that you can validate. And once you, you know, you, you make sure it, it's coming from a trusted, from a trusted party, then this token contains the information you want to know about that user. And that, that's a, a really simple contract. You, you, you go to an STS, the STS makes it happen and sends you back the information about the user, you know, just like Active Directory back in the days. Mm-hmm. Now, how does a secure token server relate or fit into this concept that we hear so much about now called claims-based authentication? Okay. So claims are really um, just a way to, to, to describe the identity of a user. So... Again, this is not a new idea at all. So um, Active Directory had claim support since day one. They, they just had a very limited support for it. So uh, in Windows security, we basically only have two claim types, as we call them. One is the name of a user, and one are the, the groups this user is member of. And um, so basically every group is a claim, but not every claim is a group. So claims are more like a broader concept. Like think of key value pairs, like, you know, first name, Dominic, last name, buyer, uh, favorite color, mm-hmm. blue. Yeah. So basically a, a way to, to describe the identity of a user using key value pairs or statements as we call them in, in claims based identity. Okay. And when you're passing claims around, do you pass less information or less context? Do you like? Do you have to do less because you really only care if uh, if someone meets the claim or not? You don't need all of the information about them. Well, typically, uh, protocols have a way of telling the STS uh, which claims you are interested in. Mm-hmm. So, so for example, you can say, "Hey, I I, I want to know profile information about Dominic." So that might be the first name, last name, his nickname, maybe a link to his profile picture, stuff like that. Mm. Or you, or you might say, like, "Okay, I need his email address," or maybe you only care about having a unique ID of the user that you can use to correlate local information with that user. So that's basically up to the application asking for those claims. Okay. I'm trying to get my head around this. I'm trying to put these things into the context of how ex- how I do things in existing applications. Like right now, um, I understand that I think the people who are listening understand how to do basic authentication against a person. And then we always have this, this can be, let's just refer to it in the context of ASP.NET, this old idea of I- is in role. Right. Mm-hmm. Where we, we have a data, another database somewhere that keeps track of whether or not a user is in a particular role. How does that differ from passing a claim around? 
Like, is the claim <laughs> cryptographically significant somehow? Well, um, again, the way this works is typically, I mean, let's, let's relate that maybe to forms of authentication in ASP.NET because that's a close uh, idea, yeah? yeah. Just that the f- the form now doesn't live anymore in your own application; it lives in a central place. Mm, okay, that's a good. That's a very good example. So, like in in forms authentication, you always had to you had to provide the login URL in your web config, for example. Right. But this had to be a local URL in your local application. The way these authentication protocols work is you specify basically a, a URL to some other server, uh, other server's login page. Right. Okay. And then the, the, the user gets bound to this server. This server is connected to the database that holds the password of the user, for example, and also holds, you know, other information like his roles, for example. And then once the, that central authentication server is done, it, it passes the information back to the, to the application that, are, that, that, that was asking for it. And the way it, the, the, the physical format it passes that back is called a security token. So that's a cryptographically sealed data structure and this thing contains the claims and which claims it contains depends typically on which claims the application wants to know about that user. Okay. So the thing that we passed around in the context of ASP.NET was an ASP.NET formatted cookie that, you know, had some cryptography in it. But this this new format, is this a standard? Has the world gotten together and agreed that this is how we store these things in cookies? Um so the cookie will will and is still an private implementation format because you you don't use cookies to cross boundaries. So the way the authentication service exchanges the data with the, the client application, that has been standardized. And that is now called a JSON web token. That's basically a JSON formatted data structure which has, you know, key value pairs. And um the authentication server passes the information to the claims back to the to the client application using this JSON web token format. Then the client application validates the JSON web token and turns it into a cookie. And from that point on, it doesn't really matter anymore because this cookie is a private implementation detail of the application. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a website that's jwt.io. Right. That's really very educational. It's a good way to go up and see uh, tokens and then chop them up into their component parts. So yeah, I, I use that thing all the time when writing code. Like, like uh, it's a, Brilliant way to debug your JSON web tokens, so to speak. Yeah. So you, you are, you are, you are playing with your token service. You want to see what's coming back. You just copy and paste this thing into the, into the website and they show you the, the contents because JSON web tokens are base 64 URL encoded. So, you know, that makes it just easy to look to, to, to have a peek inside of the tokens. Mm-hmm. Now, I have to say though, as an old timer, uh, a lot of this feels very familiar to the things that we were doing with, you know, WS security. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, except it's curly braces instead of angle brackets. What are we yeah. doing differently? And how, how much of this is the past coming back versus new, new ideas? <laughs> so all of these protocols, to be honest with you, they are just re implementations of Kerberos. That's why I love this protocol so much because it had all the ideas in it. So Kerberos was binary and obviously not internet friendly. Then the second wave was kind of WS security, as you mentioned, which was, or, you know, like text and XML encoded and could be transported over HTTP. But the problem with WS security is that it's way too complicated. So you need like a fully featured XML stack on, on every platform you're using, which, which supports, you know, XML encryption and XML digital signatures. And, you know, with, with the advent of the, the small factor personal computers, like your phones, for example, people were looking for something, you know, that can be implemented with, you know, JavaScript or, you know, easier to use technologies. And, um, W security still has its place. It's, it's around, but, um, it is considered to be very, very heavy, especially for mobile devices. And you want to, you know, people often use the term API friendly. So it, it must be API friendly mm. uh, and, and it must be mobile friendly. And the JSON web tokens completely meet this criteria because, you know, JSON is the native format in, in JavaScript and every platform out there can read and, and craft JSON. So now, JSON web tokens in the JWT dot, well, let me rephrase the JWT dot IO website comes from this company called Auth Zero. Right. How much of this is 
what you call de facto standards versus standards that someone's in a, you know, a bunch of people in a room really agreeing on. Okay. So JSON Web Token is an RFC. It's, it's a, it's a standard. Um, all the, the protocols, um, that I'm describing but haven't mentioned yet, which is called OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. They are all standards. So we are right now in a pretty good spot that we actually have standards that everybody agrees on. They are easy to use as, you know, opposed to W security, for example, and they are interoperable. And um, so right now we are in a, in a, we're living in really good times for, for these kind of technologies. Do now, so on the ASP.NET side, there's been kind of a, a number of reboots of identity over the years, uh, some mm -hmm. more successful than others. And, uh, and you've been very, uh, outspoken about what you thought was good and what you thought wasn't good. And is it true that you and, uh, your buddy Brock Allen kind of got together and said that, you know, here's a, here's a better way to, to do identity? Um, so Brock, um, I know Brock for like, I think 10 or 12 years now. And, um, you know, like when we start, when I started building identity server, the very first version was called starter STS. So, you know, which kind of transports what, what I had in mind, like giving people an easy start to, to get these technologies into their applications. And then it evolved over the years. And, um, so starting with identity server version two, Brock and I worked together. So for the last three or four years, we've been pretty much, you know, working almost every, every day together on, on, on the identity. Oh, I see. Stuff. So you kicked it so, off and then you found your, your, your kindred spirit. Yeah. Luckily, um, um, because the, the, the first couple of years, it, it, it was all me, but it became too much work. Um, to be honest. So, um, I was always like, as, as I said in, in the beginning, um, more like on the protocol side of things. So I was totally interested in how to, you know, implement these protocols that, con that, you know, that, uh, transport the tokens back and forth and how to build the tokens and how to validate them and these things. Um, and I remember like Brock and I had like a conversation a couple of years back and we were like, you know, <laughs> angry about the original ASP.NET membership system, the membership mm -hmm. provider. Like, uh, Brock and I ha have been teaching for many, many years, and we, we we basically explained the membership and the role system to many people over those years. And I always had to show them that there's this base class called membership provider, and you have the 28 methods on that, and you don't care about any of those besides the validate user one. <laughs> um so one evening we were basically choking or I, I was choking basically saying like, you know what? This membership thing needs a reboot. <laughs> and that's why that, that, that's where Brock, you know, picked up the idea of like, Oh, let's write a something called membership reboot <laughs> and membership reboot. Um, is basically an API over your database, like just like the new ASP.NET identity that is uh, part of ASP.NET. Um, so Brock was more at the times, at least more concentrating on how to store users, how to validate users, how to store passwords in a secure way, where I was more like focusing on how to transport that stuff over the network, like the, the, the outcome of the authentication event, so to speak. And, you know, um, we've been working on, on that ever since. And I think last year we finished version three of identity server, which is now a pure implementation of OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, where you can plug in whatever identity system you like. You can plug in the membership reboot, you can plug in ASP identity, or you can write your own or connect to an existing one that might be uh, around in your, um, you know, in your, in your company mm -hmm. already. And the reason why we basically chose to basically rewrite the whole thing and, and focus on these two protocols, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect is because, um, it, they are like the, the perfect fit for building these modern, web and mobile applications that are powered by web APIs. This episode of Hansel Minutes is brought to you by Braintree, code for easy online payments. If you're building a mobile app and you're searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. The Braintree V.0 SDK makes it easy to offer multiple mobile payment types. So you can start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, credit cards, and more, all with a single integration. One small snippet of code, and you're set up in less than 10 minutes. If you don't have time, you can give them a call. They'll even handle the integration for you and walk you through it. 
The SDK supports seven languages, .NET, Node, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby, elegant code, clear documentation. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash Hanselman. That's braintreepayments.com slash Hanselman. What do what should the person who's listening who who may be an ASP.NET person think about how this fits into what comes out of the box and how you know what parts have you said this is better versus saying this is an extension and this adds new functionality? So um on the on the side of storing users in databases, it's pretty much a matter of taste. So membership reboot and ASP.NET identity have pretty much the same feature set. Um, Microsoft started like a year later than, than Brock did, but catched up quite quickly. Um, the feature set is very, very similar. They use different coding styles. So that's more or less like a matter of taste, if you like. Um, I wasn't particularly happy with, um, you know, like what used to be called the um, OAuth uh, bearer authorization server middleware or something by the time. Um, which is the thing that can, that can create tokens. So since I was always like the, the token creation geek, so to speak, yeah, um, I thought like I, I can do that better. And we, we, um, we, uh, created this thing called identity server, which is also a middleware, um, you know, plugs into the, um, Owen Katana pipeline just as the other middlewares, but it, it is designed right from the start at a much higher abstraction level. So my main point of critique for the, the built in middlewares by the time was that you still had to know the protocols very, very, uh, detailed to not have security problems where, where we in our middleware, you know, took, took a step back and said, okay, um, we want to shield the typical developer from the protocol details, but give him enough um, uh, expressibility, so to speak, to to model his application architecture. So um, we we don't require people to understand all of the low level stuff and you know like which which per- parameter must go to where and what's the signing algorithm and all these little things. We kind of give them three main things that they can model, which is clients, which are the applications that are re- requiring authentication. Mm-hmm which are um, users, which are your humans, your carbon-based life forms <laughs> in your, in your right. system. And, uh, and the, the so-called scopes. So, so scopes is a, is a term from the OAuth specification, which models resources in your network, like, like your web APIs. So you define clients, users, and scopes, and identity server takes care of the rest, so to speak. Yeah? And it's very flexible. You've got how to do it in MVC, how to do it in Web API, how to do it in WS Federation. You've got self-hosting. You've got, I mean, it's, it's surprisingly deep. Uh, particularly, I'm impressed with your, your server, your samples. Uh, you know, they go on and on and on. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the whole flexibility on the hosting side of things, like on the server side of things, uh, was actually enabled by Katana. So Katana for me was like one of the, the the most important things that that came out in the last years, which you know gives me the flexibility to host it like in IIS or in an anti service uh, embedded into an application, things like that. Um, and yeah, and and then it turns out once once you implement those protocols, which are really designed from the start to be cross platform, and there there are no no barriers um, for the clients to 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 take part in that, you can write so many different clients for that. I mean, from, from highly powered .NET framework clients to, you know, embedded systems, uh, as long as the client can speak HTTP, it, it can take part in, in, in that, in that system. So talk to me about where identity server would fit into a world where we have all these, these companies like Auth0 that are promising to make things easy. Like what is Auth0 for and why would I use them and not identity server? So, um, we, we made the, the very deliberate, um, decision that identity server is not like a, a, an off the shelf product. We don't have an install Mm. XC. We are a framework basically. So we require a, a developer to, to start using it, to start customizing it. So the whole point is we want people to be able to customize it. So it's, it's a DLL. You download a DLL. You have to host it in your own process. Um, you have to write code to, to get it working. 
And uh, by using that approach, I think we have achieved a great deal of flexibility because if, if I learned one thing over the last, you know, 10 years of consulting um, is that, you know, you talk to 10 customers and they have 11 different ways of doing things. <laughs> yeah. So, so with the previous version of Identifier, we kind of took the, the off, off the shelf approach and try to make everything configurable and so on. Yeah. And it, it turned out it, it didn't work that there were so many times people had to customize the source code to get what they want. And, um, it's, it's funny you mentioned all theory because they're actually good friends of mine. And I, I, I looked at their mm. product and when I saw their UI, I thought like, wow, there's, there's no way I, I, I want to compete with that. So they have a really good user interface, you know, like, uh, for all zero is made for people that don't want to own the technology in, in their own, you know, like in their own team. They, they, they want to be able to go to a web interface and, and configure stuff. And they are really good at, at their configuration story. Um, uh, and, and, and be done where we say like, you know what, we give you a, a framework and you can customize it in ma much, much more ways than you can ever customize an off the shelf product. So that, that that's kind of the, the, the distinction between us and things like, uh, products like Auth0. When you choose identity server, A, it's a .NET based library. So it, it mostly appeals to .NET shops, really, where people write C sharp code. Um, and you have to be prepared to have a developer or a team of developers that own that feature inside your company. Whereas, you know, Auth0 or also Azure Active Directory falls in, in the same category. You're buying a hosted product. Um, you, you don't have to host it yourself. You don't have to know that much about the internals as you probably need to know with our stuff. Um, but you also have less flexibility. Okay. And the idea, and, and the other thing is, especially in Germany, um, a cloud only solution in the security space is not that interesting for most people in, in, in Europe. Um, where, you know, Azure AD is a cloud only solution or zero also has an appliance option, for example. But, um, still, I think the main distinction point is a, a framework versus a product. Okay. That's a really, that's a really good way to explain it because it's, it's confusing out there for people who are interested in doing it right, right? And everyone wants to do authentication right and they want to do it in a way mm. that, um, that solves all the problems that they have, Fut future proofs them, you know, this seems to be the, like we seem to have, um, as an industry, st finally started to standardize in a way that we could write solutions that we don't necessarily have to rewrite uh, again in a few years. I think that the main, the main success story for Identity Server is that over the last one and a half years now where we've been integrating it into systems, we never ever had to customize the source code for for a customer for mm. example so they 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 could just use the the um the api service that we provide to customize it in any way that it fits their workflows their existing databases their you know existing regulations and you know everything that that is non standard and is that because you're just so pluggable and you've gone out of your way to make things pluggable yes i think we you know like the last Eight years or so of being in the, in the security token business, <laughs> kind of, uh, we, we've found a good balance between, you know, what is, what are the things that people shouldn't know about or shouldn't have to know about and what are the things that people want to change. And I think we are, we are really happy with how that turned out with the version mm -hmm. three. Yeah. So if you hit, uh, identity server dot IO, uh, you're, you're given mm -hmm. the choice, identity manager, identity server, identity model. Mm. That, that kind of yeah. left me wondering what to do next. Can you explain those three things yeah. and what I'm supposed to do now? Yes. So strictly speaking, we are involved in three big open source projects, but like we are only two people. <laughs> so the, the main one we're working on is identity server, really. Um, that is actually also part of the .NET foundation. That's, um, um, a .NET foundation project as well. Um, and that's the, the security token service. That's our OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect implementation. Mm -hmm. Then there's Identity Manager. And I think you wrote a blog post about that, uh, like a year ago mm -hmm. or something, which is uh, like an, uh, an, an, um, a user management tool made for admins or developers. So, uh, you know, roughly speaking, it's, it's like a replacement. You've, back in the days, there was the, the, the ASP.NET configuration tool or something, um, built into Visual Studio that allowed you to, to create users, to put them into roles and all these things. 
And that got removed at some point. So, uh, Brock basically wrote this replacement for it. So it's a, it's a web-based user management tool. Um, not for self-service because many people are asking for self-service. Like, do we support things like change password and reset password? No, it's, it, it's more like an admin or a developer tool. So you can, you know, ha- have a view into your user database. And again, we support, um, ASP.NET identity and membership reboot out of the box. And identity model is actually a collection of helper libraries that make, you know, your life a little bit easier when dealing with this claims based security. It's uh, for both .NET and also for JavaScript. So we, uh, we've written JavaScript clients. Uh, um, that's actually Brock's uh, little project. Um, JavaScript clients for connecting to OpenID Connect servers, like, for example, Identity Server. But there are also... Um, um, .NET based libraries, um, for example, again, same idea, uh, like an OAuth client, for example, so that you don't, um, have to know the protocol. You basically say, give me a token. You, you know, you use a, um, a library for that. So I, identity model are tools. Identity manager is the user management story and identity server is our token service. Okay, cool. And when I, when I show up here and I click on identity server, is there a particular, uh, you know, primary place for docs? Are you keeping them all on, on the wiki or, uh, is there a, uh, I know that you have got the identity server documentation, uh, site. What are you doing your docs in? Is this markdown or? Yes. Uh, we're using markdown. Um, and we're using basically, uh, GitHub pages like hmm. Checkill. So we are, we are, um, that, that turns it into a static, a static, uh, mm-hmm. web page. And uh, the, the 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 main reason we did that is, uh, or the, the the main feature I love about it is that p- when people f- want to improve the docs or find typos or whatever, they can just send us a pull request and uh, um, we can update the docs. Yeah, or if they want to add docs to it, like uh, we had that, like where somebody added more explanation to a walkthrough. You know, that's uh, that's that's so easy to, to do with this uh, yeah, approach. Yeah, I really liked the page called the Big Picture. That uh, sits down and explains to you, you know, how apps usually work and how apps work when you have all the different protocols plugged in, you know, whether it be OAuth 2 or, you know, how SAML works and OpenID Connect and how it all plugged together. Right. And also that there's there's another one called terminology, which I think is really, really important, which explains basically what are users, what what are clients, what are scopes, because these are the... Strictly speaking, the, the the only free things you have to understand. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So people can check all of this out at identityserver.io. And uh, definitely a big thanks to you and, and Brock. And, and uh, do you have any uh, any other um, people who are helping or do you have pull requests coming in? Yeah, I, it's amazing, actually. Yeah. So when we started with this version free, um, we immediately kind of had the feeling that we were like hitting the sweet spot because like... Uh, this thing wasn't even done yet. And we had like, uh, hundreds and hundreds of issues, like, like people actually asking questions and improving stuff. And we have, uh, let me have a look. Uh, we have 23 con- contributors. Um, I mean, you know, mostly smaller stuff because there were not that many people out there, which, you know, <laughs> Have fun <laughs> writing security libraries. Yeah, it isn't exactly uh, <laughs> high on my list of fun things to do, which is why I'm, which is why I'm so glad that you guys do it. Yeah, I, I actually got to get a lot, a lot out of that. That's yeah. great. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me today. Yeah, this has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>